Yeah, okay, so, so go ahead and bring that other image really quick. Welcome to the Valley of the Kings. The Valley of the Kings is that Lisa's been to um, is f- over 400 miles to the south of Giza. Now, why is that important? Because we know that every single pharaoh in Egypt was buried here. So then why are they telling us that the Great Pyramids were built as tombs for the pharaohs? It makes no sense. People aren't asking the right questions. This is where they were buried. We know that. This is why this structure exists. All the dynastic pharaohs were built here, meaning that it has nothing to do with the pyramids at all. And pyramids are not about tombs. And that's a very much a, a manipulation of information. So uh, let's, in the, let's continue because I want to be able to have time for all these. So go ahead and go to number four, too. So go back one image. Okay. This is so important for people to look at this. I cannot emphasize this enough. Remember, cyclical, cyclical catastrophes on Earth. What you're looking at is a snapshot of the climate of the planet over the from ice core samples that come from Greenland. Greenland is one of the most intact ice caps in the world. So what you can do is you can drill down through ice caps. You can then take those ice caps and analyze them based on the little bubbles of, of, of air and different, in different levels of carbon, all those things, carbon monoxide, and all those things that are within those areas. And you can measure what was the temperature and the climate like back then. Okay. We're all told, Hey, look, Oh my God, the world is, it was so hot right now. It's never been this warm and all these things are going on. Look at where we are in the sheet. If people don't know on the far right is our current time period. Okay. It says present global warming. It almost isn't even distinguishable on this. Like it's, you can barely even see it. Okay. And I'm not saying us polluting our world is good. That's not my message at all. I'm just showing you facts. Now look at what the climate was like 12,800 years ago during the same time that Gobekli Tepe was being buried in all these, in these civilizations that we talk about around the world were all destroyed. We're talking about an over 1,000 year period of earth history where catastrophes, climate change, and events were so severe that they literally caused the, the order of magnitude of temperatures on their planet to fluctuate in a level that we can't even comprehend. They have found mammoths in Siberia, the, one of the most um, the cold, resilient animals on Earth that have, were found frozen with undigested food in their stomach, okay? Meaning that those woolly mammoths, look at, the, look at the timetable right there on some of those temperature drops, those woolly mammoths froze to death instantly. Instantaneously. Yes. We're talking about climatic changes on our planet, tectonic changes, volcanic changes, climatic changes that were so severe that it wiped out entire chapters of human history with civilizations that were so advanced and sophisticated that they knew all of every energetic point on the earth, the secrets to higher consciousness, to have humans reach their highest states, okay, left behind all these texts and all these things around the world, and then they just vanished and disappeared. Okay. Now, more importantly, that we're as we're going to show as we go along here, the structures we find, like in Baalbek, Lebanon, the Yangshan Quarry in China, and the unfinished obelisk in Egypt, those civilizations had reached the height of their sophistication, not the other way around, and then they just mysteriously vanished, just gone. Can, can I ask one question for clarification yeah. uh, uh, on the stat up here, the far right present global warming? You just said something. Uh, you sort of skipped over it really quickly, but. Yeah. We, we aren't helping the Earth's climate right now by cutting yeah, down I mean, all the forests and the ozone yeah, layer. I get all that. Yeah. But what I heard you say is the the idea of global warming, it's a cyclical thing. The planet for thousands yeah. of years goes yeah. through a cycle, warm, cool, exactly. warm, cool. And we have ice core records that reflect that scientific data that shows that we've had freezes and meltdowns, freezes and meltdowns yeah. multiple exactly. times. So. So just a question, why does the concept of global warming, why is it pushed so geopolitically so heavily all the time right now? Just quickly. Two reasons. One, and one I very much agree with, yes, we're polluting the planet. It's not good for it. It's just enhancing a natural event. That, mm-hmm. 100%. Mm-hmm. We definitely need to go to renewable resources, look into Nikola Tesla technology if you don't believe that energy can be free. He but, was into, he was researching ley lines. That's Isn't that kind of going he back? Knew, he knew what the ancients knew, okay? Yeah. 
And that can get it. That's actually what's going to get into when we talk about number 10. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no it's fine. Um, so basically imagine. I'm like a kid like, in a candy, candy shop with you, just by the way. I'm just like, there's so yeah. much information. So imagine, now this is great. This is a great roundup of, of information. Imagine you had these cyclical events where the earth gets very cold and then gets warm over and over and over again. So when it gets cold, you get ice caps. The Laurentide ice sheet in the northern hemisphere, in North, northern North America, and then the Eurasian ice sheets, they form, and then the earth gets warm, and then they melt. But guess what? Those events don't happen slowly like we're told. Those events happen like that. And you can have an entire ice cap with billions of tons of ice that can be liquidated in a very short amount of time, which is why during the last ice age, the megafauna across North America, like, right, the, the great tigers, the Siberian to tiger and the, the huge giant beavers and the, all the woolly mammoths and all those creatures, they all just disappeared. They disappeared because of this cycle. And that's the whole point to, is to come across is that they disappeared and also the ancient master civilizations disappeared as well. And so it has to do with a lot of comp complexity that have to do with salinity in the oceans and currents and s solar impacts on the earth and a whole variety of different things that go into how these events transpire. But that's, I just want to get this across that like what we're experiencing right now and all throughout our current human history is like nothing compared to what happened um, during what's known as the Younger Dryas, which is, which is the period of 11,000 to 13,000 years ago, which you can see on the chart there. Crazy. Okay. Next yeah, question. So we, won't, gonna... we won't spend a ton of time on number five. Okay. I'll just, I'm going to briefly mention number and talk about number five. Yeah. Okay. So we are told uh, that one of the greatest philosophers in history, Plato, made up the entire story of Atlantis as just a metaphorical thing for our society. If you actually go do the research into where he learned that story, it'll blow your mind. So what happened was Plato's great mentor who was known as Socrates in, in, in ancient Greece. Okay. Socrates had connections and information with uh, another philosopher in Greek poly named Solon. Okay. Solon was like the first Greek philosopher and poet to travel to Egypt long ago before anyone else from the Western hemisphere. And though that part of the region was ever had ever visited there And Solon ended up visiting a temple in Egypt known as a temple of Sais. Okay. He goes and he visits these temple priests and the temple priests of Sais go tell him, Solon, I want to tell you a story, an ancient story that needs to be known in case something happens and it's wiped out. It needs to be known by the world. He tells them, the, the, uh, tells Solon that the earth has gone through great catastrophes on, in more times than we know and that civilizations have risen up and been destroyed. He tells them the greatest civilization of all that ever existed in our entire history was known as Atlantis. And he goes in to tell him that they had the entire story written into that temple, the temple of Sais. Okay. And he tells him the whole story. These are temple priests that were like protecting one of the only places that had this knowledge left. And Solon takes that whole story of Atlantis where he had detailed descriptions of Atlantis, the, ri the circular rings of the great city. And it wasn't a single place. It was a civilization. That's what I want to get across. It was a civilization in the Atlantic. And he gave them very, very specific details that it, it existed in a place, probably somewhere near the Azor Islands, where you find three tectonic plates come together in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Okay? Three tectonic plates come together in one location there. And that, it, it, what's funny about that, or not funny, but interesting, is that the, destruct, the description of Atlantis is that it was destroyed and it's submerged and was completely lost under the ocean. Well, if you have plates that are shifting in a place like that, you can get massive subduction, subduction of plates that can literally take up land mass and throw it down the bottom of the ocean. And that's exactly what Solon went back and told Socrates, and then Plato wrote the whole thing down. And that's how we know it, through what's called the Timius and Critias. And they had all kinds of details of this civilization that was completely destroyed in these catastrophes and wiped off the face of the map. And we now think of it as a myth. It'd be like if we disappeared and then another civilization came later and didn't think that we were real mm -hmm. and thought that we were just a myth. And I, and we don't, we don't need to go too far into that because we have a lot of other topics to cover. But basically, if you go read the Timius and Critias, they give 
detailed descriptions of that location and how not only was, do we think like, think of the Greeks, Plato and Solon there, there was also a pre-Greek culture that existed before what we think of as the classical Greeks, just like these civilizations all around the world, Sumer, Japan, China, in parts of Asia, Turkey, and along the Mediterranean, Peru, through Mexico, the Maya, even the, the pre, the pre Maya, the pre Aztec, the pre, um, the pre Inca. There was all kinds of civilizations that existed there. They were all wiped out. And then other civilizations came and built in the same places. And we know that if you check this out in Mexico, in the Yucatan, there's a temple called Ushmal or a site called Ushmal. And there's a temple called the temple of the wizards. And the name Ushmal means built three times. Meaning that that Mayan civilization that, that that's credited with building there, they're the third version of that civilization that had rebuilt that temple over and over again. Three different versions. We see that all around the world, and that's the emphasis I want to get across, is that those civilizations, they try to pass on whatever they can, okay? And this is what's fascinating. Why, why did Egypt know about the story of Atlantis? Because the Temple of Sais... Was one of the was one of the only temples that had survived with that knowledge because the entire Egyptian civilization, the Great Pyramids, was built because the sages and mystics of Atlantis, before it was going to be destroyed, went off to other parts of the world, like Egypt, to create and mystery schools and all these structures for multiple reasons, but to try to have the information carry on to the next civilization before their entire civilization was wiped out. And interestingly enough, the Temple of Sais was demolished by another empire later on and disappeared. And we only have descriptions of it when it existed. Think about like the Roman Empire came into Alexandria and burned the entire library to the ground. We lost all those records. That's what's happened over and over again when like the Roman Empire, very corrupt and terrible empire, decided to rewrite the entire message of history. That's where this corrupted story begins is because of the Roman Empire. That's a really interesting point, and we can we expound on that for a second. So when when there when a warring empire takes over another empire, they wipe out all the ideology and history that existed from the pro, from the culture they invaded, yes. so that they so that they can indoctrinate and raise the people of the empire that they just took over, so that there won't be any uprisings. The laws are changed, the rules are well, changed. They can rewrite the story, though. Rewrite they can everything. Rewrite the story. So that the younger, so that the younger generation that comes up is taught the new versions that that like in the case of the Romans that they're prescribing, correct? That's what exactly, and that's why in Mexico the flag of Mexico has is an eagle eating a serpent. That's ne- that was never an, an indigenous ancient civilization symbol. It has to do with an ancient war of empires around the world. The eagle has always been a war empire on every single, nearly every empire throughout history, and the serpent has always rep- represented knowledge and higher consciousness which goes back into the dragon, which is why Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl in Mexico were de- depicted as feathered dragons. And then you see dragons in China and Japan, and you see them depictions of the serpent all throughout Egypt and in Mesopotamia, because there was, there's these great secret societies and empires that have been battling throughout history to erase the other side, to rewrite the entire story. That's a conversation well for another story, but the eagle is actually on our uh, empire's emblem, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Ready for the next question. So at the, at the outset of the call, you said that humans were considerably smarter than we that we're giving them credit for. And, and as far as 13,000 years ago, you have evidence to sort of prove that. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Absolutely. For that. Yep. Ah, uh, here we go. So people don't believe we're talking about those big blocks. Welcome to the stone of the pregnant woman in Baalbek, Lebanon. Okay. That stone remained unfinished and unmoved at the height of their sophistication, right? They were getting ready to move it and bring it somewhere. And then they just vanished. That stone weighs 1,100 to 1,200 tons. Okay. Now that's hard to put that into perspective, but that, that would be like putting, you know, countless 18 wheeler trucks or whatever you could in this massive pile. And you'd have to do the math. You'd have to do, well, you know, how much does like a, a, a standard bus weigh or a sedan or like an 18 wheeler fully loaded. And then you'd have to do the math versus this being 1100 tons. And you could do, you could do the, try to calculate that. But we're talking about weights that are so massive that we could not move this stone today. We could not. 
and these civilizations were building massive temples. This is in in a place called below the Temple of Jupiter, which the Romans built on top of, just like these other civilizations. The Romans are the ones credited in Baalbek, Lebanon, with the Temple of Jupiter, which I don't have on here, but this is it's right next to this. this is the quarry of Baalbek, Lebanon, where they got the stones. But basically, they built right on top, and then our modern history books say that the Romans built it. Okay, the Romans were the ones that built these. No, the Romans had no way the capability to do this. We're talking about a civilization that was much more ancient and sophisticated that they just built on top of, just like so many others throughout history. So what you're looking at is if you go look up Baalbek, Lebanon in the Trilithon block, which is bigger than this, you'll find that the lowermost base of that temple, just like this, had all these massive blocks and then they, they built on top of it. How do you know that they were in the process of moving this somewhere? What's the scientific evidence on that? Because it hasn't gone anywhere. This is the quarry. This is the quarry where all these stones came from. And when you go and look at pictures of the Baalbek quarry, all these stones are like, hun they're half finished. Okay. They're like, they're, they're, they're were ha Sorry, about to be moved I that. Or, about, or about to be carved. And then all of a sudden they weren't. Like if you were to put this much work into something and then just abandon it, something very significant would, would have to happen for that to be the reason. And that, and that significant impact was that chart I showed you ago, a, a minute ago, which was that, that event that occurred between 11,800 years ago and 13,000 years ago with catastrophes that were so severe that it wiped these civilizations out. We're talking about tectonic plague and act activity and volcanism and melting glaciers that would have literally created tsunamis around the world in, in events that are beyond our comprehension. So just for comparative purposes, I Googled to see what uh, was the equivalent of 1,000 tons, and it, it's equal to nine fully grown adult blue whales, just to put that in perspective. There you go. And that's the largest mammal on Earth. Yeah. That's right. Wow. So let's go ahead and go to the next one, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time here. Okay. Okay. Now, remember we talked about earlier on in the show, how do you leave a message behind? Right? You can, these blocks exist. Yeah, they, these megalithic blocks with precision exist all around the world. The pyramids do. That's great, but that doesn't actually leave a written message where we can, we can actually read. Welcome to the Ashurbanipal Library. People have heard of the uh, Library of Alexandria that the, the, that the Romans burned down, but almost never, no one's heard of this library, but this is the greatest library ever amassed in history. Okay. Now, the remember how civilization emerged out of, out of the Fertile Crescent of, of Mesopotamia, Iraq? Mm -hmm. Well, it did, but it, it emerged much earlier than we're told. Okay, and we're going to get into that in the next one. But more importantly, <clears throat> if you were going to leave a message behind, there's only one way you can do it. And that's what's so ingenious and sophisticated about these civilizations. You could, either in stone or in clay, you could etch into something right? So it's embedded within it, a message, and then you can fire the clay. In most places, in most cases, they use clay. There are stone, like the Code of Hammurabi is a, is a stone, what's known as cuneiform tablets, okay? Cuneiform writing. Now, <clears throat> what's wild about this is that <clears throat> this library, which is, which is in the modern near what's today known as Mosul, Iraq, in the ancient city was known as Nineveh, okay? Back in the, back, back in the, um, thousands of years ago, in 1849, specifically, these, these were buried, though. But in 1849, a man named Austin Henry Laird did an excavation of that region. They dug down and they found this library, okay? A library with over 30,000 of these cuneiform tablets in it. Now, <clears throat> what's important to know about that is that they learned that this the, the, the reason it was called the Ashurbanipal Library is there was a great king known as Ashurbanipal, and he realized that the information in these tablets, <clears throat> he didn't write them. He realized that it was so important that told, I'm talking about the entire story of where we came from, who we are, how old we are, where the influences came from. Everything was written in these tablets. More importantly, if you do research into, let me give you an example. Gobekli Tepe, that, that the astronomical um, stone circular temple we sh I showed a minute ago. When they were, I'm just digressing, but I'll come back to this in a second. When they were digging down through the layers to, to uncover that temple, they found this record of what's happened over time, right? At the very lower most layers, they saw hunter-gatherers, hunter right, with primitive tools and, and fires. But then something happened, like out of the blue. 
within a very short time period in this in these soil samples they saw agriculture and sophisticated civilization just emerge like blossom out of nowhere and that's why gobekli tepe was sub subsequently built that story because remember that's in the fertile crescent region that's north of where this is that story is is the, what's echoed here if you look up where everything came from in our in our civilization everything mathematics metallurgy animal hus husbandry astronomy um fermentation um agriculture which is th the the blueprints of a civilization you don't have agriculture you will never have a civilization you look at literally everything that makes up the component of our society it all came from here iraq all of it it all came out of nowhere and what do they tell you they don't say that they discovered it they don't say that at all they talk about some kind of an influence long ago of what they called the anuna some kind of a group that came here and i, and I we're not even going to go into the term alien because i hate the term aliens i really don't like that term and i don't think they are really aliens as we think there's no ships that came here nothing like that we're talking about some kind of an incredible group of like multi-dimensional some kind of an status beings that beyond our comprehension that knew everything that had the wisdom of the entire cosmos came here created us in their image from this earlier primitive hominid this is what everything states this isn't me talking go read the atrahasis go read the enuma elish go read the myth of adapa they created us in their image and we became this sophisticated incredibly highly conscious being and then they gave us the knowledge to create civilizations and they emerged all around the world and then they they went around they taught all these things to civilizations that's why those teachings stopped and when those civilizations were wiped out by catastrophes that's why they became primitive because those influences no longer existed ever again that and, and, and i know you're not going to go down this the conversation because this would take forever multiple episodes but you just said created in his image which sort of the first their first, image when their it, their image. When you said that, the first thing that I heard you say, or at least most people hear you say, is a reference to the Bible, because that's a reference created in his image. It is, because and, the, the Bible was written from these tablets. All the, Most of the information in the modern Bible came from these earlier sources, but it was rewritten in a different way. Context. Crazy. So, um, you want me to continue? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Ashurbanipal, I'm going back again, a great king of, Mes of, of Iraq, of the city of Nineveh, okay? He recognizes that the entire story of humanity, all of this is, is recorded in these tablets. He existed over 3,000 years ago, okay? And he even said that in his time, these were ancient, long before him. And he knew he was a priest also. He knew that he was an intellectual and he knew that these were important. So he sent out his armies to every corner of these ancient temples in the entire region. And they went and found every single tablet and they brought them back. And he created subsequently the greatest library in history known as the Royal Ashurbanipal Library. And that's what Austin Henry Layer discovered in 1849. And that's what this part of this exhibit is. This is only a little fraction of it, but here's what's wild about it. When they discovered in 1849, it's what's um, it's what's, it's a it's a dead language, a cuneiform Sumerian Sumerian cuneiform is what's known as a dead language. And you have the Sumerians, you have the Akkadians, you have the Assyrians, you have the Babylonians. We're talking about multiple epics of civilizations that have been here. And here's what happened though: when they found these tablets, no one knew how to read them. No one knew how to read them at all because it's a language that had died out over a thousand years before, and nobody knew how to read it. Okay. It was, it was, a, it's a, it's what's known as a, and I'm studying how to, how to actually read cuneiform. It's what's known as a language isolate, which means it's not shared in any singularities with any other languages in the world. It's like an alien language. Okay. And what, the, what happened was it wasn't until the late 1800s, like 1878, that a man, a true hero of history that I, I will go to my grave making sure he's remembered. His name is George Smith. One of the greatest minds in history of our entire modern history. He spent years studying this, these, these, this, these cultures and studying these symbols. And that's the thing is they had no alphabet. 
There was no cuneiform Sumerian alphabet, which is important because if you can figure out what the alphabet is, you can then figure out what the entire message is. They, never, they had no alphabet. Every character had an individual character and a word meaning that was, that was unique. So it means you had to figure out every single word. Okay. So George Smith, brilliant mind. I cannot emphasize it enough. He spends years reading these years cooped up in a library. And one day he cracks the code. He figures it out. First person in, in one, 2000 years to figure this out. And he's at first, the first set of tablets he translates is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And then he subsequently translates a, a numerous others later. But here's the wild thing is that those things that are kept in those tablets telling the entire creation story of us and how great gods came down and like created civilization and taught us all the knowledge. And that's why these megalithic civilizations and the sophistication of the pyramids and all this stuff is so crazy advanced because they were taught that. Now, of those 30,000 cuneiform tablets, only a few hundred of them have ever been translated. And they remain in a dusty, mysterious attic, places like the Vatican archives and these secret locations around the world where they don't want people to know what's on them. So I can only get my hands, and this is my expertise and where I study is not just megalithic civilizations, but it's cuneiform tablets. I've spent years and years on this to figure out what the true story is. And we only have a couple hundred, if that, that has actually been translated. And they tell a completely different version of our story than we're told in school, completely different. So what happened to this historian? George Smith went on to live a good life and he translated so many tablets and he wrote one of my favorite books in history, which is known as the Chaldean account of Genesis. And he is a genius in my mind. And then all other Assyrians, they're called the Syriologists because it's ancient Assyria. It's not called the Sumeriologists for some reason, but others came along the, down the road like Samuel Kramer and Stephanie Daly staggered into the 19, um, 1950s up through the 1980s. And they took George Smith's work and they said, and they did their own translations and they matched it on like almost identically. They were all on the same page. It wasn't like they copied each other. They verified each other. So if you take these versions of these tablets, because people are automatically be like, well, how do you know they, they, they translated them correctly? You simply take the greatest researchers in history that have studied this, not Sitchin. Do not read Zechariah Sitchin. Sorry for anyone that's going to be offended by that. But take these other translators, George Smith, Samuel Kramer, Stephanie Daly, and a few others, and you can cross-reference their versions, and you get to find out the story of everything. Which Wait, is- why not Zachariah Sitchin? Because I have read him. Why do you say he that? He is not a cuneiform expert. He did not. He had no training in this at all. Hmm. His, his, I've, I've calculated that's because that's where I started too. I became obsessed with this. I wanted to know the truth. I've calculated his translations are twenty to thirty percent accurate. Oh wow. Can you can you just describe to me what we're looking at in this picture? I know you're saying they're records. Like, what's the yeah. size of them? What would they look like if you could like hold them or see them or be yeah, face to face with them? Sure. So these are fragmented pieces because they're so ancient. Okay, we're talking about we're talking about pieces that are like this this big to this big to this big that are all like pieced together. And this is in the British Museum, and you can go visit this today. You can see this exhibit, but again, it's only one little fraction of it of what actually was found. And so, so hang, on, hang on a second. So, cause some people just listen audio. When you say this big, you're talking a few inches, six inches, eight inches. Yeah, so you're uh-huh. talking um, a few inches to six inches to up to like 10, 12 inches. Um, cause they're fragmented. So they, they, that's the other trouble is they found a bunch of these all jumbled and broken because clay breaks and they had to try to fit them all back together. And so we get when, when the problem is you start to read these from the translators and they'll just trail off and be like tablet fractured and broken message unknown. And then you like have to try to fill in the blanks, be like, you know, Matt went blank to blank a walk or something like to take a, you know what I mean? You have to try to fill in like, well, what is that story trying to say? Because it's broken and dis- and, and destroyed over time. But I want to emphasize that what they have in here is amazing. They talk about these cycles. They talk about catastrophes. They talk about wiping out civilization here. They talk about how these creator gods knew about these cyclical catastrophes and they allowed them to wipe everyone out because certain things had happened. And there's a, there's a particular tablet I want people to read called the myth of Adapa that goes into how the perfect, the perfect human was created known as Adapa, which was the later biblical term known as Adam 
or Adamu was his original name, but Adapa was the same individual and he was created in perfection. And I mean perfection, like in the image of these creators, that's what you want to call them. That's why I want people to get away from the straw, away from the term like alien and ships. None of that happened here. There's the universe is much more sophisticated and amazing than we know. Go ahead. Can I ask a question about that? So the cyclical effect where the, the earth basically recycles itself every 13,000 years, do you suspect that that's by infinite design or is that, is that part of a larger picture of the universe? It, I don't really understand the cause and effect it's behind really, that. really, really complicated. And it's interesting because there's a tablet, there's a set of tablets called the Enuma Elish, mm -hmm. where it discusses how they may have played a hand in that. And that goes, that goes down to a completely another rabbit hole on why that they would want that. But we're going to get into that on, on number 10. So don't, so don't worry. Okay. So, but I want to leave everybody with understanding that we were created in perfection. I can tell you, I give you an example of evidence that shows that. Okay. If, if all of this is through Darwinism here, through natural evolutions on this planet, right? Take a human, for example, and people might not know this, and it's important that they look into this. Human beings, the whole, the, the symbol of the serpent, 